I have shown in this channel the big and fancy coins of Alexander the Great. Pieces such as the very popular silver tetadrachma and, for those with deep pockets, the exquisite gold staters. Marvelous works of numismatic art there are on my list of coins I would love to have, but likely will never be able to buy. But, if there is one mantra I adhere to, is that ancient coin collecting is for everyone. For an economy to work, yes, you needed the big silver and gold coins to allow for big transactions and major commerce to function, but as products and services trickle down to the everyday people in their purchases, fractional coinage was very important, as it allowed the small things to be purchased. Food, minor services, household items, consumables, the small things in life had to be traded. Alexander conquered a highly monetized territory, which can be explained by the dozens of different mints that struck silver. The minting of bronze had a more local character. Precious metal coins had to have a series of monograms and control marks, indicating they were produced to following instructions from a central, royal authority, while bronze coinage is mostly anonymous and local. That is, it doesn't bear any control symbols apart from some issues that have some control marks indicating local issues by municipal authorities. So, okay, but what about denominations? Which kinds of bronze coins were struck? For that, we will need to first get a bit of context by looking at the smallest silver coins of Alexander's monetary system. We will start by the drachma, the quintessential silver coin. It is the most common coin of Alexander's silver issues, and it is a good reference to what the average daily wage of an average Greek would be. A manual laborer could expect to earn one drachma a day. A foot soldier, a hoplite or phalangite, around two drachmae. We then look at fractional silver. Much rarer than the 4.3 grams drachma, the, there were the hemi drachma, so half a drachma, around 2.15 grams of silver. And then the obol, worth a sixth of a drachma, a tiny coin of around 0.7 grams. The problem here is, even with a sixth of a drachma, this is still too much money for the smallest transactions. It would be the equivalent of buying bread or doing some very basic groceries with a $50 bill. Not that an obol would be the equivalent of a $50 bill, but it was a small denomination, true, but it wasn't small enough. Well, now that I think about it, inflation worldwide right now is getting so bad that some very basic groceries, quote-unquote, should likely cost more than $50. This is where the bronze coins come in. There are three denominations, all based on fractions of the obol, so the smallest coin. The obol itself was divided on eight parts, called chalkos, meaning bronze in Greek. Chalkoi for plural. We will go over each individual coin in broad strokes. They are typically classified as half an obol, so a tetra chalkoi, a quarter of an obol, so a di chalkoi, and an eighth of an obol, a single chalkos. There are different designs for each denomination, so let's explore the main types in this video. And we kick things off with the hemi obol. This was a coin with a relatively high value. In the classical period, the hemi obol was struck in silver, a tiny little coin of around a half gram, while this bronze piece weighs between 5 and 7 grams. This solved two problems for the state. It generated a coin that was much more practical to use. You can imagine trying to handle a coin weighing half a gram. It was complicated. And the cost of producing a bronze coin like this was vastly inferior to the price of producing uh, the previous tiny silver coin. The bronze contained in this coin was only worth a fraction of its denominational value. So it was a small but significant, I would say, source of revenue to the state. Similar to the silver drachma, on the obverse we have the bust of Heracles, wearing the skin of the Nemean lion. And just like the drachma, there's a wild variety on the quality of the artistry of these busts. Some are very well made, while others, well, not so much. Fortunately, our example looks quite good. Looking at the reverse, now we have a design exclusive to the bronze types. 
Here we have the weapons used by Heracles, the bow with a quiver to hold its arrows, and a heavy club used by Heracles to stun the Nemean lion. Between both weapons, we generally have an inscription. The most common, like in this example, says Alexandro, coin of Alexander. If you like collecting varieties, this is an interesting type. Among some of the most common varieties for this reverse, there are those that replace the name of Alexander for Basileus, or king. These are so-called the royal types. Some other types depict a beta and an alpha, an abbreviation for Basileus Alexandro. There are also some varieties that change the quiver for a Goritos. This was a specialized case, used to hold the bow while on the march. The Gorintos was also capable of holding arrows, so it was a more practical way of carrying your bows and arrow into battle. Much rarer, but also part of the Hemiobo denomination, are the horseman types. It features Heracles on the obverse, while on the reverse we have a horseman, with the title Alexandro over him. This type is inspired on previous coins struck by Alexander's father, Philip II, and could very well be a very early type of bronze coin a transitional type between Philip's earlier coinage and a proper coinage struck under Alexander with his own unique designs. We then move down to the Dichalcoi, or a quarter of a noble. This is likely the denomination with the most types and var varieties, and the most numerous of Alexander's bronze coins. Some of the pieces in the highest grade might be a bit pricier, although you would only have to pay a premium on something absolutely pristine and mint state. Otherwise, these should be among some of the most common Alexander coins out there and one of the most affordable Greek bronze coins, particularly this type I'm showing here now. This is a shield and helmet type. As we can see on the obverse, it has a little Macedonian shield, like those used by Alexander's phalanx soldiers. These come in many different types, with this particular example showing a thunderbolt at the central boss in a series of circular pa patterns and pallets around the border. A really cool type. On the reverse, we have the Macedonian helmet, with its protruding tip and a crest on top of it. Under the helmet, in this particular case, we have a little delta letter. On the and on the fields to the left and the right, the letters beta and alpha for Basileus Alexandro. To illustrate this variety on designs, here's another example. This is another one of the most common varieties. This time, on the center of the shield, we have the face of Heracles, looking straight at us. Unfortunately, since it's also the highest part of the coin, it was the first part to be worn down with use, so now we only have a faint, a faint outline of his face, like a little blob. If you ever find one of these with the face still recognizable, jump on it, as it's quite hard to find one. In this example, we also have a series of circular, circular patterns around the central boss. Heading to the reverse, we have the crested helmet. Although this time it also features a couple of cheek pieces to protect the user's face. Apart from that, we also have the usual beta and alpha on the fields. This is such a smart design. Whoever came up with this idea was really good with propaganda. Everyone at the time would have seen Alexander's great phalanxes, his great armies, every soldier carrying their shields, each one individually decorated with symbols, drawings, patterns, and looking at these coins immediately makes me imagine a series of these shield designs overlaid over a roll of Greek soldiers, like I'm putting on screen right now. The shield and helmet design was immensely popular. In fact, it kept being used in bronze and silver denominations in Macedonia until Perseus, the very last independent Macedonian king. Apart from the shield and helmet types and their nearly endless varieties, for the Dichalcoi denomination, we also have a type featuring the face of Apollo and a prancing horse on the reverse, with Alexander's name, a type very similar to another bronze denomination struck by Philip II. 
and a very scarce type that features the bust of Heracles on the obverse and an eagle on the reverse, also with Alexander's name around the borders. We finally get to the humble Chalcos. Now we're talking about a truly small denomination, an eighth of a noble. You would need 48 of these to make a single silver drachma. As you might have seen already, it is quite similar to the first coin I've shown, the Remi Obo, but you won't mix them up because this is a minuscule little coin. Typically, these are around 10, 11 millimeters wide, and they won't weigh more than 1.5 grams. As you can see, it comfort comfortably sits on the tip of my index finger. And design-wise, it is basically that, a miniature version of the Hemi Obo, featuring the bust of Heracles on the obverse. I love this particular coin. It is an absolutely outstanding example with a ton of detail in such a tiny little flan. Whoever sculpted this die must have had very good eyesight. And it is a miracle that such a tiny and delicate thing has reached our days in such good shape. The reverse sadly isn't as sharp, but I can't blame the engraver. Imagine trying to engrave Alexandro for such a tiny design. These letters are less than a millimeter tall. Remember they engraved these dies by hand. Over the name of Alexander, and once more we have the quiver and the club. Although I su suspect in this particular example, instead of a quiver, we have the Goritos. And there you have it. A quick and easy guide for the main bronze denominations of Alexander the Great. If you want to specialize in these, I recommend you look at the Price Catalog, the main reference book for Alexander coins, as well as the Pella database from the American Numismatic Society, as there are tons of different types and subtypes listed there. Do you have a bronze piece of Alexander? Let us know in the comment section down below. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Leave a like and consider subscribing if you did. Happy collecting, and I'll see you soon.